Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Emanuel Bilund. I'm from Stockholm University. I'll be talking about learning to think in a second language. And as you notice, I was not able to be there in person. Uh, circumstances had it that I could not come to Montreal this time. I would very much have liked to, but it simply was not possible. Uh, so I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Daphne for inviting me and uh, also to thank Yom for helping me to work uh, out this setup, thus making it possible to give the presentation uh, in spite of me being absent. So like I said, uh, this talk is about learning to think in a second language. And the outline of the talk is as follows. Um, I'll be mentioning a few general things about multilingualism um, and reasoning. After that, we'll move on to the terrain of language and emotion. How does this relate to reasoning? And the third part of the talk, we'll be looking at language more specifically, uh, that is linguistic structures and how they influence cognitive processes um, and thus similarity decisions and other high level cognition. So why would we want a multilingual angle on reasoning? What's the use of a multilingual approach to the study of reasoning. Well, we know that language is critical for higher cognitive processes, and reasoning is, of course, not exempt to this rule. So, the question we ask then is what happens when an individual brings multiple language systems and language knowledges to a reasoning task? Do these languages interact with one another and do they out, uh, influence the outcome of the task in some way? We can start by defining multilingualism. Um, there are a few different ways of defining multilingualism, but the one we've chosen here for this lecture is as follows. Multilingualism is the use of two or more languages in everyday communication. So by this definition, we highlight two aspects that are quite important. First, we highlight the aspect of uh, knowledge or proficiency or mastery of a language. And second, we highlight frequency of use of that language. So for somebody to be called multilingual, then the person needs to have a certain degree of mastery of a language and uh, he or she needs to use the language in everyday life. You can become multilingual in many different ways. You can study um, a second language in school, starting using it more often. Uh, you can move to a new country or a different linguistic context and pick up a new language in that way. You can grow up uh, having learned two or more languages from birth already, etc. A multilingual person can be bilingual, trilingual, quadrilingual, etc. It's a very broad definition and it's quite convenient and suitable for this purpose. Uh, the truth of the matter is that in this definition, then, more than half of the world's population is multilingual. More than half of the world's population use two or more languages in their everyday lives. So multilingualism is, in other words, a very global phenomenon. If you travel around the globe, uh, you are then bound to, more, to meet more multilingual people, multilingual speakers, than, by, uh, sorry, than monolingual speakers. And the fact that it's so common with multilingualism um, makes the study of multilingual reasoning uh, important as well, because it brings ecological validity. 
um, to this enterprise. Um, monolingualism being as common as it is, if we only studied reasoning in monolingual speakers, we would lose an important piece of information about how um, this language constellation, which is so common in the world, uh, influences reasoning. So looking at reasoning then among multilinguals, and in particular reasoning in a second language, a second language here is any language that is not an individual's mother tongue. So any language learnt after the, the mother tongue. It might be in childhood or it might be in adulthood. So is reasoning in a second language any different from reasoning in a first language? This of course depends on the degree of linguistic involvement in the particular kind of reasoning that we are studying. But if language plays an important role, um, then arguably it should matter whether reasoning takes place in the second language or in the first language. And there are a few different reasons for believing this. Um, these have to do with, uh, first of all, emotionality or emotions in the second language. And the second has to do with the mastery or the proficiency in the language. In what follows, we will take a closer look at these two uh, factors. It's been known for a long time that emotions and emotionality in a second language is different from emotionality in the first language. There are studies on emotion-laden words, such as swear words, uh, showing that second language speakers are not as sensitive to swear words as first language speakers are. This means that they do not take as easily offence by swear words. And second language speakers also, uh, since they don't take as easily offence, they might use swear words to a very great um, extent that is offensive to native speakers. So this is something that's been known for quite some time that seems to speak to um, a different kind of emotional tie to the second language as opposed to the first language. Another example of different emotional ties to the second language has been found in studies on psychotherapy where it has been shown that talking about traumatic experiences um, is often easier to the patient if this is done in the second language and not in the first language. Uh, suggesting that with the second language the patient has the possibility to take some emotional distance to the traumatic event. So, all in all, this seems to suggest that there are greater emotional ties to the mother tongue than to second languages or subsequently learnt languages. Uh, this might be because uh, of socialization that takes place in the mother tongue mainly. What's then the um, impact of this on reasoning? Well, emotions, emotionality, is sometimes an important factor in reasoning and it seems as if these different emotional ties to the mother tongue and to a second language they may actually spill over to decision making. This has been seen in a few recent studies by Kaysar and colleagues and Costa and colleagues and we will look at how this may play out. So, picture this. You're standing on a footbridge overlooking a train track. A small oncoming train is about to kill five people on the tracks. The only way to stop the train is to push a heavy man off the footbridge in front of the train. Now, now this will kill the man, but it will save the five 
people, what would you do? Well, the utilitarian solution here is to push the man off the bridge, thus saving uh, five people at the cost of one life. But uh, our first instinct or, and our morals uh, may tell us something differently. They may say that it is wrong to kill, uh, even if it may save people. This is what's known as the trolley dilemma or the footbridge dilemma. So, Costa and colleagues took people to the laboratory and confronted them with this hypothetical scenario. The aim with this study was to see whether it made a difference if the multilingual person took this experiment in the mother tongue or in the second language. They found actually that if the participants took the test in the second language, they were actually more likely to pushing the man off the bridge. Uh, whereas if they took the test in the first language, in the mother tongue, they were more likely uh, to let the man on the bridge alone um, and letting the train run this way. This is what's known or what has been labeled as the foreign language effect. And the interesting thing in Costa's study is that they check a number of different uh, multilingual speakers with different language constellations. Um, and they find that it doesn't matter whether you're bilingual in Spanish and English or Korean and English, you still make the same choice or you, there's still a difference between how you would behave in your mother tongue as opposed to your second language. Um, one could think that it might be that you behave differently in the second language because you might be less proficient in that language. So you cannot perceive the situation in the same way as you would to have in your mother tongue. Um, they did, however, control for proficiency and they did run post analyses to check whether there was any such effect and it indicated that this was not the case. They also ran um, some control experiments where they had participants taking other cognitive tests in the second language to see whether performance was poorer in the second language than in the first, and this was also not the case. So the results by Costa and colleagues then they do seem to suggest that when moral dilemmas are faced in a sec in sorry in a foreign language or a second language, um, this seems to promote deliberative processes and reduce emotionally driven responses. The cost-benefit considerations seem to be more pronounced when you reason about this dilemma in a foreign language. And in this way, you also increase the utilitarian choices or judgments in this particular task. So these results then, they are quite in line with what is known from previous research on emotion and second language. Uh, that you have great emotional distance in your second language, and this may play out not only in psychotherapy, but also how you reason about dilemmas. Um, and the results also fit very nicely with models on moral decision making um, that look at moral judgments um, as an interplay between emotionally driven processes and rational. Um, deliberative or thoughtful thinking. So, further findings from these research groups show that the use of a foreign language in certain tasks that involve 
um, not only moral judgments, but also risk assessments uh, seem to be differently carried out, such that individuals um, are less likely to take unnecessary risks and um, more likely to detect risk if they are presented with the scenario in a second language than in the first language. Uh, again, suggesting that uh, deliberative considerations uh, are increased in a second language. These findings are very fascinating because they really show that um, the way that you behave may very well depend on uh, the language that you speak. And this takes us to the second part of the talk, which is linguistic structures and similarity decisions. So here we are going to narrow down the focus a bit and we're going to look more particularly at language, more specifically at linguistic structures and how they might influence reasoning. Um, does it matter um, the linguistic tools that we have available to us when we reason about different scenarios, when we are, are asked to make a decision on something. Does it matter what language provides us with? This is a very old question, um, and in the realm of reasoning particularly, um, it was addressed um, in the 1980s uh, when researchers started looking at counterfactual reasoning and language. A number of researchers looked at uh, Chinese, uh, which in some linguistic analyses did not have a clear uh, linguistic marker of counterfactuals. Uh, so counterfactual here then is, is um, a counterfactual reasoning concerns. It's the speculation as to what might have been or what could have happened if some detail or event in the past had occurred in a different way. If uh, Caesar hadn't gone to the Senate, he wouldn't have been stabbed, for example. Uh, now, the fact that Chinese in some analyses lacks a clear counterfactual marker uh, may some researchers suggest that Chinese speakers would be less accurate with counterfactual reasoning as opposed to, say, for instance, uh, Spanish speakers, where you have very rich uh, verb morphology. You have verb forms showing that something might be a possibility, it might be counterfactual, and so on and so forth. Uh, this debate uh, went on for a few years. It never really led anywhere, mainly due to the lack of uh, hard empirical evidence showing one way or another that this had an effect on counterfactual reasoning. But as probably some of you detect here, uh, the problem is um, part of the complex of linguistic relativity. Linguistic relativity holds that language, um, that language influences thought, and this has as a consequence that speakers of different languages will think differently. This is mostly associated with Benjamin Lee Wolf and his uh, mentor Edward Sapir, and this is called the linguistic relativity hypothesis, the Worfian hypothesis, the sapir whorf hypothesis, and so on and so forth. Um, in the 1990s, there was a surge in research on linguistic relativity. 
Um, this was mainly due to the fact that whereas people in the past had approached the relativity problem uh, more as a philosophical problem than as an empirical problem, um, methods from cognitive psychology now offered researchers with the necessary tools um, to actually investigate uh, thought in a more thorough way. So by defining um, thought uh, as a range of cognitive processes um, such as memory, uh, categorization, classification and so on, it became possible to assess the potential influence of language on thought. Over the past few decades, researchers have then looked at the influence of language on a number of perceptual domains, such as colour, time, space and motion. Colour might be the most researched uh, domain to date, where you investigate whether the presence or absence of a given uh, colour term influences how that colour is perceived and cognised. The question then in the realm of multilingualism is if speakers of different languages think differently about the world, what happens when you learn a second language, when you learn a new language? There are a few different outcomes here that could be possible. Um, the one is that nothing really changes. Uh, the thought patterns of your first language might be so ingrained that they do not change when you learn a second language. Another possibility is that uh, you may very well acquire a new way to think about the world, and that would be at the expense of uh, the way that you thought about the world in your mother tongue. Um, yet another possibility would be uh, that you can have parallel ways of thinking about the world depending on the language that you are engaged in at the moment. So we're going to take these broad questions and try to specify them a bit more. Uh, and we're going to start doing that by a little uh, task here. I'm going to show you a video clip and I want you to tell your, the person you're sitting next to or yourselves um, what is happening in this scene. So, unfortunately, I cannot uh, hear your descriptions. I cannot ask you how you would have described the scene, but I would guess that some of you would have described it as two people are walking to a house, others, two people are walking on a road, two people are walking on a road to a house, um, or simply two people walking. Okay. Um, this is what uh, we call a motion event, this particular kind of action. A motion event is physical displacement of some kind. Uh, there is an entity that is in motion, in this case it's two women, uh, and uh, there is a ground uh, along which they move, a trajectory of the motion. So this is a typical motion event. Uh, motion events are unlike objects, colors, etc. Uh, motion events are not static. Uh, 
but they evolved through space and time. And this is what makes them interesting because it's something that we capture with language in instances as they occur. Motion events are also fundamental to human everyday life. So there's a point in studying how we talk and think about motion events. We regularly move from point A to point B during the course of a day. So what was this task about then? What was it that I wanted to show here? Um, it relates to what we call event endpoints and grammatical aspects. By event endpoint, I mean the goal uh, intended or unintended of the event. Uh, we'll start with endpoints then. Uh, in this case, the potential endpoint of the motion event was the house that was in front of the women. Now, research looking uh, using this experiment has shown that speakers of some languages, such as Afrikaans, Dutch, German, Kosa, and Swedish, uh, they mention the end point. They mention the house. They say two people walk to a house um, and they also look then accordingly at the house. And what's interesting here is that they do so to a greater extent than do speakers of Arabic, English, French, Russian and Spanish who do not mention the end point, but rather say or describe the scene as uh, two people walking. Uh, and they do not tend to look at the house either. So they omit the house both in speech and in visual attention. The interesting pattern here is that we can group these languages on the basis of what we call grammatical aspects. Grammatical aspect is a linguistic uh, structure or category um, which we find in English, for example, um, where we have the simple form and the progressive form. We have John sings versus John is singing. We have a similar distinction in the past in French and we have in Spanish uh, similar distinctions in the present as well. In Russian we have even more complex grammatical aspect distinctions. Um, and these then seem to play out when it comes to motion events and how we look at endpoints of motion. Um, within cognitive grammar uh, it is common to talk about viewing frames. When we have a scene, we can adopt different perspectives to the scene. Um, we can look at an event in its entirety, which means that we take a step back and we include in the viewing frame more or less everything that's in the scene. This is what we call a maximal viewing frame. Uh, and what we call naked or bare verbs, they denote maximal viewing frame. They take a holistic perspective at the event, they don't break the event down um, in different phases, uh, which progressive aspect does, that is the form singing, or in this case walking. Um, what progressive aspect or imperfective aspect does here is that it zooms in on the event. It zooms in on the event in its unfolding phase to tell us that the event is ongoing now. But by doing so, it also leaves out the larger picture, the bigger picture, whereby we can see the, uh, the endpoints of the events. So, what this then says about motion endpoints 
and grammatical aspect is that if we speak a language um, that has progressive aspect or imperfective aspect, we are constantly zooming in on events. And by doing so, um, we experience an entrenchment of these immediate viewing frames. The result of this entrenchment is that we become more focused on on goingness. We 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 um, build up a sensitivity to the unfolding phase of an event uh, to a greater extent than does a speaker who is not constantly encoding uh, the difference between zoomed in and zoomed out, but only speak about events in terms of zoomed out. Uh, we can test this in, in different ways. People have looked at eye tracking, as I mentioned, how you allocate visual attention. Uh, people have looked at how you simply mention endpoints or not. Um, and you can also look uh, behaviorally uh, how people um, in decision making um, deal with uh, motion endpoints. To do this, me and my colleagues devised a similarity judgment task whereby we asked participants to group different motion events together. Uh, we had a target scene. This is what you call a triads matching task. We had a target scene uh, which had a medium degree of goal orientation. This means that, for the example on the screen, the woman is walking towards the car, but she doesn't reach the car. Uh, the clip ends before she reaches the car. This was the target scene, and it was supposed to be paired with one of two alternates. The first alternate is the one where the endpoint is either not visible or it's extremely far away from the person who is moving. Uh, this is then the endpoint that has a very low degree of goal orientation. The other alternate with which the target scene could be paired is the plus endpoint alternate. This video clip has a high degree of goal orientation and it shows a woman entering a building. She walks into the building. This is why it has the plus endpoint denotation. Uh, the finding here is that if you speak a language that does not have grammatical aspects such as Swedish, German, Afrikaans, and so on, you'll be more prone to think that the plus endpoint alternate is more similar to the target scene than the minus endpoint alternate. This is because you would construe the target scene as containing an endpoint. And since the plus endpoint alternate has a visible endpoint, you'd be more prone to pair the two together. However, speakers then of uh, languages such as English, Russian, Spanish, that have grammatical aspects, they are more prone to match the target scene with the minus endpoint alternate because they construe the target scene as not having an endpoint. And therefore, it's more natural to pair it with the minus endpoint alternates. So these are findings that come from monolingual speakers, at least functionally monolingual speakers, meaning that uh, they might have some foreign language skills, but they are very limited, and they do not use their foreign language skills for any practical purposes. So this is the findings from these speakers. And we know that in this process, in the process of deciding on which um, alternate to match with the target scene, there is a great involvement of language, because if you run um, a dual coding task whereby you ask participants to 
do a countdown from 10 or to repeat numbers, the differences between uh, these language groups dis disappear. So it's very clear that people to carry out, uh, to make these decisions, they recruit language, they recruit linguistic resources. So the question then is, what happens if we deal with multilingual speakers? By taking a multilingual approach to this, we can ask also how stable these preferences really are. Um, does learning a new language that has a contrasting way of zooming in or zooming out of events change the way that you think about motion? Um, the studies conducted to date that have looked at this do indeed seem to suggest that the learning of a new language influences how you think about motion. We've looked at uh, German speakers acquiring English and English speakers acquiring German and uh, we see that their preferences for making decisions about similarity uh, between motion events actually change as a function of learning a new language. This means then that English speakers who learn German become more goal-oriented or more endpoint oriented whereas German speakers who learn English become less goal-oriented or less endpoint oriented Now, an important uh, factor here is proficiency. Um, and in order for this um, shift, we can call it a cognitive shift, in order for this cognitive shift to take place, um, the individual, of course, needs to have some mastery of grammatical aspects. And I myself, I'm a speaker of, I'm, I'm, I'm a native speaker of Swedish, um, I speak Spanish as well, uh, and I struggled quite a lot in the beginning with acquiring dis the distinction between the perfective and the imperfective past. Um, so quite often when you come from a non-aspect language and you are about to learn these aspectual distinctions, it is quite a tough task. And for any cognitive shift to take place, it is of course a precondition that you master the structure itself, or that you at least have a partial mastery of this distinction. And this is also what has been found, that the shift is greater in individuals who master these aspectual distinctions as opposed to individuals who do not master these distinctions. Um, another effect that has been found is frequency of use. So individuals who learn a new language and master these distinctions um, are more likely to exhibit this change in behavior if they use the language very frequently. If they don't use the language as frequently, these patterns of attention allocation do not seem to become entrenched enough so as to bring about this behavioral shift. So the next question we'll ask ourselves here um, is whether once an individual has acquired um, the way of the new language to reason about or to think about motion, um, how plastic is this behavior? More specifically, do multilingual speakers think differently about motion depending on the language context? And in this case, by language context, we mean, as in previous studies, um, the language that the task is carried out in, the language that you receive the, the instructions in, and so forth. The studies by Kesar and Costa show that moral reasoning is actually susceptible to language contexts, such that it varies depending on whether it is the first or the second language of the individual. But what about similarity judgments? What about deciding on uh, motion similarities? Is this sensible to language contexts? 
Well, we ran a couple of experiments where we tested this. We had German English bilinguals um, who took this uh, adjustment task and the person who administered the task spoke either German or English. Uh, for some participants, they were randomly allo allocated uh, to one of the two. And these were bilingual speakers who were born in Germany, had German as a mother tongue, and had acquired English in school, and then later uh, used this language in their everyday lives in one way or an another. The results show that those who carried out the task in English, they actually behave like English monolingual speakers, like English native speakers, uh, meaning that they were equally prone as English native speakers to disregard the endpoints of motion events. Now, the opposite held for those who carried out the task in German, those who received instructions in German and who gave their responses in German. This group showed to pay equal amounts of attention to endpoints as German monolingual speakers. And again, we controlled for proficiency frequency of use, etc., to make sure that there was no such confound present in these, in these experimental groups. So these results then suggest that, um, as we've seen before, the acquisition of a linguistic structure can tilt the relevant decision making in a certain way. Um, and this decision making then is also flexible. It is very flexible and it is so as a function of the language context that the speaker is in. Uh, one language context triggers um, a specific behavior um, and it's worth pointing out that even, even though we find um, a language context effect as has the studies on moral reasoning, um, the locus here is a bit different. In the moral reasoning studies, the um, locus of the effect has to do with emotional distance that is being enhanced in a foreign language or in a second language. In the case of decision making over event similarity or motion similarity, um, emotional distance isn't what explains the sensitivity to language context. Rather, here we find different de behaviors depending on language context uh, that occur as a function of the particular characteristics of the languages involved. So if we have a language that has grammatical aspect, then this is likely to trigger a particular kind of behavior that is not more distant or more deliberative or uh, analytical than would the behavior be triggered by non-aspect language. So even though we find language context effects both in moral reasoning and similarity judgments, the underlying mechanisms are very different. By way of ending this talk, we can then summarize by saying that an, ind an individual who possesses skills in more than one language uh, may be influenced by those skills when deliberating a choice, when in the process of um, deliberating over a selection of different alternatives. And this holds true for two quite different types of reasoning involving moral and similarity judgments. The exact nature of these language influences on reasoning remain to be investigated. <clears throat> this is because researchers has only recently started 
directing attention to these phenomena. What also remains to be investigated is the limit of these effects. So in this talk, we've been looking at um, instances when multilingualism matters for reasoning. Um, of course, there will be instances where multilingualism does not matter for, for reasoning, um, even when it may be expected to do so. And this is, of course, equally informative as to the role of language and languages in reasoning. What seems certain, though, is that some of these discoveries do have important consequences for our everyday life. Um, this holds particularly true for the studies on moral dilemmas and native versus foreign language effects where we could see a scenario where the same situation is being judged differently depending on whether the person making the judgment um, is behaving in his first or in his second language. I believe further research on these matters is definitely needed. Okay, uh, thank you very much for putting up with this uh, presentation format and I hope now that I shall be able to respond to any questions or comments live. Thank you very much.